Well, good morning, Maranatha. Come on, stand up and say praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We've been blessed to be in this house of God one more time together. Come on, let's give him praise. Praise you, Lord. Glory to God. Amen.
God. Hey. That's what I'm talking about. Come on, let's just lift our hands and yes. praise. Come on. Amen. Come on. If you if he's worthy, if he is worthy. Not if, but he is worthy of all praise and all glory and all honor in Jesus' name. Lord, we worship you. Jesus, we praise you. I will tell of your mercy, your unfailing love. I will be to the glory of your name. Like a bear, they will see you. I am lifted up. They will speak to the one upon goes like this. Your glory will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. And the earth will sing of your praise.
It's a praise of his people. We don't have to wait for two to become one. He wants to inhabit the earth this morning. And he does that through every church that glorifies his name. His presence will dwell. So, so come on, just glorify his name. You do it. Come on, just give him praise. He says, I will, he is seated on the throne of his people. my cross you bore so I could live in the freedom you died for and now my life is yours and I will see of your goodness forever
scores together. Lord, we just come before you today, Father. We exalt you, God. We lift you up. You are high and lifted up. Father, we praise you in your house today. We praise you in spirit and in truth, God. We've come to worship you today. Lord, you're worthy and you're altogether lovely. There's none like you. Lord, you are the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last the one who was and is and is to come. You are the great I am, and there's none like you. There's none above you, there's none beside you. You're wonderful and you're glorious, God. And we give you praise today. We give you praise, honor, and glory. We lift up our hands and we lift up our hearts and we lift up our voices to you today as one church, one body, one bride. And we praise and we worship you, our King and our God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. He's good, isn't he? Let's give God some praise this morning as you go to your seat. He's worthy. He is worthy. We don't have very many announcements this morning. Hallelujah. But one big announcement that we did want to remind everyone of is that two weeks from today, we are going to have a very special guest speaker in the house, and that is Pastor Dwayne Vanderklok. And if you don't know who he is, please go on YouTube, Google him, listen to him. Uh, he is wonderful. He's a wonderful man of God. And we have gotten to uh, sit down with him a few times uh, and have dinner and, and speak with he and his wife, and they are wonderful, wonderful people, and you are not going to want to miss that. Uh, <clears throat> also, don't forget to give. Don't forget to check your Maranatha Messenger. All the information, all the announcements, everything that you need to know is always in that. So as you get your email, don't forget to look at your Maranatha Messenger. Amen. And I would ask everyone to please make welcome our Mount Olive and our St. Mary's campus. And all the men at both of those locations. Praise the Lord. You have any other announcements, baby? Yeah, that's it. Well, I can tell you look good this morning. Thanks. Yeah. I'll help you down the steps. My wife has heels on this morning. It is one of the first times she has been able to wear heels since she had uh, surgery on her uh, ankle there a couple years ago. And she said uh, steps make her a little nervous. She asked me if I would uh, walk up the steps with her to help her. I think she just wanted to hold my hand, to be honest with you, is what it really was. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 11. I will be preaching mainly from... Um, John 11 this morning, but I will hit many different um, other parts of the word. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, it sure is good to see you this morning. Tell your neighbor you're looking good. Praise the Lord. I don't know, Mike, what, she, did, did she tell you it was looking good? And you're like, yeah, I know. Because that, that was the look I got. Oh, Johnny in the back, yeah. Okay, can I get you to, to lock in with me just for a little while? I have a very important word to deliver this morning, and I believe that it will be great help to you if you would just listen to it and receive it. I want to talk to you this morning about the most encouraging word that wasn't heard. I'll take it from John, or I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 11. 
I'm sorry, it's Matthew 11, not John 11, Matthew 11. The text this morning I want to center around John the Baptist. And who is John the Baptist? John the Baptist was the only child of Zechariah the priest and the only child of Elizabeth who is known in the word to be barren. In other words, she was not able to have children. John is a miracle child. He came to them in, in later in life. Can you imagine being in your 60s or 70s and having a surprise as a child? Let's just pray that it was back then and not now. Amen. John the Baptist is the third cousin of Jesus. Now get this. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit while he was in his mother's womb. He was filled with the Holy Spirit when Elizabeth and Mary saw each other after a prolonged time. And as they come together, talked, and embraced, it said that the baby inside of Elizabeth leaped and was filled with the Holy Spirit. That was John. John the Baptist is the preparer of the way. He is the forerunner of Jesus Christ. In other words, he was the one sent before Jesus to begin to plow up the fallow ground and to make the way for Jesus. His role was crucial. In John chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 3, it's the same account in both chapters, John has the privilege of baptizing Jesus and introducing Jesus to the world and to who Jesus really is. In John chapter 1, verse 29, it says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is what I mean by he began to introduce to the world who Jesus really was. He was the one that was able to recognize who Jesus was. Why? Because he had that witness in his mother's womb when he was a baby. At the same time that Elizabeth was carrying John, Mary was carrying Jesus. There was a special relationship between Jesus and John before they were ever born. There was no question in John as to who Jesus was. John was an exclamation point in the kingdom of God. And I want you to think about this for a minute. He introduced Jesus to the world and he baptized Jesus. And think about how blessed, how honored, how privileged and how humbled and how important he was and in his position in the kingdom. Seriously. You know when the hand of God is upon you and you are in a divine appointment or position. You sense the power of God, the anointing of God, and it's humbling and it's valuable and it's important and you know it. John is confident that he knows that he knows who Jesus is. Now let's fast forward 16 months. Tell your neighbor, John was an exclamation point in the kingdom. Matthew chapter 11. Now John is in prison because he preached the message to King Herod that King Herod didn't like. John preached to King Herod, it is unlawful for you to marry your brother's wife. You are living in adultery. And I want to reference Matthew chapter 14. King Herod's wife, Herodias, was humiliated, angry, and bitter because of the word that John gave to her husband, the king. Now I want you to see something. She is so bitter, she's so angry, she's so humiliated that it drives her to perversion. Herodias takes her daughter, which was not the daughter of the king, but was the daughter of the king's brother. Herodias takes her oldest daughter and throws a birthday party for the king, and she offers her daughter in a sexually provocative dance. And it's, the word says that it so pleased the king by what her daughter did that he said, I will give you anything you want. Matthew 14, verse 8. Being prompted by her mother Herodias, the daughter said, Give me John the Baptist's head here on a platter. When you are in a position to be used by God, it's a great thing, but it stirs up the enemy. Now, Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. Now, I remind you, John's in prison. 
Now when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one or do we need to look for another? I want you to notice that John's time is short. He's in prison, he's in bar, behind bars, and he's in chains. And he sends two of his disciples to go find Jesus and ask him, are you the one? Notice how John went from an exclamation point to a question mark. I'm not here to put John in a bad light. I am here to draw a parallel between John and us. But now that circumstances have changed, he is questioning and doubting that Jesus is the one. Have you ever been there? The word hasn't changed. The promise hasn't changed. But time and circumstances has. Your mind is flooded by the enemy with doubt. Everything is magnified. Voices are loud and many. I guess everybody's just so sanctified you don't battle with that. Nothing's changed. The prophetic word you received is still in operation, but it hasn't come as quick as you thought. And when it didn't come, when you thought it should, doubt begin to creep in. And there's times we can go from an exclamation point to a question mark. Listen, when this happens, you have to understand something. When the enemy begins to come in like a flood, God wills raise up a standard against him. Where do you go? What do you do? When doubt or question begins to come in, you do what John did. You go to the source. You go to Jesus. And this is when you have to dig in by faith. Come on, David. Sometimes you got to encourage yourself in the Lord. Sometimes it's just you and God. But I remind you that God is the majority and all things are under his feet. You were created for this moment. You are making history together with God. Sometimes you just got to encourage yourself and remind you who you are in the Lord. It doesn't matter if anybody else can see it or not. As long as you know you and God make the majority, you just have to keep on going. Stop giving a flip about what other people think and what they say about you. All you need is a word from God, and that's it. You just keep on going with Him. You stay before God with a pure heart. I told him Wednesday night that success is inevitable as long as God is in it. All you got to do is keep God in the equation. Success is inevitable. Look at Jesus' response in Matthew 11, verses 4 and 6. Get a hold of this. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things of which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are being raised up, and the poor hear, and the gospel preached to them. Now, blessed is he who is not offended because of me. In other words, Jesus said, you go tell John what you hear and see. You go tell John you are seeing, witnessing the kingdom of God in operation. Matthew 11, verses 7 through 11. Get this. Jesus said, you go tell John what you see in here. You see, witness the kingdom in operation. In verse 7, get a hold of this. Then as they departed, John's disciples were departing to go back and tell John what Jesus said. Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What did you go out to see in the wilderness? A reed shaking in the wind? What did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I say to you, more than a prophet. This is what Jesus is saying about John. This is what Jesus is saying about the one who became a question mark instead of his steadfastness in an exclamation point. This is what Jesus said about the one over time John began to question. Are you with me? He said, yes, a prophet, but more than a prophet. 
For this is he whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Verse 11, Assuredly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not been one risen greater than John the Baptist. Jesus with his own mouth, he says, No one born of woman has been greater than John the Baptist. Jesus starts talking to the crowd about how great John was, but John nor his disciples heard it. The most encouraging word that wasn't heard. The crowd heard it, but John didn't. Jesus says, among those born of woman, there has not been one risen greater than John the Baptist. Can you imagine how that word may have helped or encouraged John? If John could have heard the words of Jesus, he would have learned three things. There's three things you need to do to stay encouraged. Three ways you can stay encouraged. Number one, you're doing better than you think you are. The only thing Jesus said, go back and tell John what you see in here. You see the kingdom in operation. As long as the kingdom is in operation, you're doing better than you think you are. Tell someone that. You're doing better than you think you are. Tell your other neighbor, yes, even you, you're doing better than you think you are. Revelation 12, 10 says, Satan is an accuser of the brethren. If he's an accuser of the brethren, then I want to be an encourager of the brethren. I want to be a complimenter of the brethren. And I'm here to encourage you today. You're, you're, You're going to be all right. You're going to make it. I know you're going through some stuff, but but God's going to get you through. Jesus loves you. You may be going through some stuff, but let keep going. You're doing better than you think you are. Maybe you're not what you ought to be, but thank God you're not what you used to be, and you're not where you used to be. Can I get an amen? You're going to get there. Stop putting yourself down all the time. Stop it. If I had your hand in front of me, I'd slap it and say, stop it. Stop putting yourself down all the time. Listen, we don't always know what someone else is carrying. We don't know their load, their struggle, or their fear. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 gives 28 seasons of life. There's a time to live, a time to die, a time to plant, time to harvest, time to laugh, time to mourn, time to dance. But one season you will not find, a time to quit. Look at your neighbor and say, toughen up, you big baby. Say, we don't quit around here. Elbow your neighbor. Say, don't you quit on me. I, get him, Frank. He deserves it. Get him. I, I, I was, you know, it, 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 it's dangerous preaching. I, you know, I was I was up here a, a few weeks ago, and I was preaching how uh, t- today's generation soft, and and how people and how people couldn't even how how people couldn't even make it today without air conditioning because they're so spoiled. They're so spoiled. I, I remember growing up in a two-story farmhouse, no insulation in it, with a tin roof, and my room was in the second floor, and the only thing I had was an exhaust fan. And I'm preaching how we need to toughen up. We got to be tough. And I go on vacation. My AC goes out and I come home. No AC. Bless God, I get to live it out. We need to toughen up in this nation. We're blessed beyond. We are so blessed we don't even know how blessed we are. The poorest of the poor in this nation is still wealthy in every. They're, listen, don't you quit on me. Elbow your neighbor again. Don't you quit. There's no reason to quit. Let me tell you, let me tell you how to get to heaven. Is that you don't stop. You keep going. Well, I'm going through hell. Well, bless God now. Is it a stopping point? Keep going. I know you're going through stuff. We all go through stuff. Well, Pastor, how do you know you're doing better than I think than you think you are? You're here this morning. You're not in a drug house. You're not hung over in some bar. You're not in the funeral home. Bless God, you're doing better than you think you are. You may be hung over, but you're here. You're going to be sober before you leave. How do you know? Holy Ghost is going to get you right where you are. 
He's going to sober you up, get your mind right, and attempt to get your heart right. Some churches may not want you hungover. I want you if you're hungover. Why? Because he gives the Holy Ghost. And it, mm, you're doing better than you think you are. Number two, you matter more than you think you do. Tell your neighbor, you matter more than you think you do. I, I, I love Isaiah 41, verses 6 and 7. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But in, in, in Isaiah 41, verses 6 and 7, they're just encouraging each other. Everyone helped and encouraged each other. I'm going to paraphrase this. The carpenter encouraged the goldsmith who encouraged the man who held the hammer, who encouraged the guy who held the nail. Don't you know the guy holding the nail needs encouraged? If someone else is swinging the hammer, it said he encouraged the one holding the nail that it might not totter that it might not wobble, that it might not stagger, that it might not fall down. I'm here just to encourage you, doing my best to hold you up, that you won't wobble, you won't stagger, you won't fall down, so Jesus can, sm can get us right on top of the head so he can do the perfect wicker in all of us. We are, so, to, tell your neighbor, say, won't you hold me up? You matter more than you think you do. Don't wait till someone dies to tell them what they matter to you. Tell him now. Let him hear it now. Nothing like standing before a, a, a standing before a casket with somebody in it and you pouring your heart out to them. They can't hear you now. How many of you have somebody special in your life? You better tell them how special they are now. How many of you are thankful for a mom or a dad or a grandmother or a grandfather? You better tell them how special they are now. You matter more than you think you do. Tell your neighbor you matter more than you think you do. When you're up to your eyeballs in stuff, and you're in the thick of the storm, and you begin to question everything, I remind you, Jesus is the one before the Father praying for you. Jesus is the one that goes before you and he fights for you. He, I remind you that all things are under the feet of Jesus. He is the one that went to the cross for you. You matter more than you think you do. How many's ever seen the movie Lone Survivor? It's about Afghanistan and the Taliban. And, and there's, there, there's this SEAL team. That I think there's about six of them who go out, and five of them die, and there's only one left. And he's in some, uh, some camp where the Taliban, Afghan camp, where the Taliban is, has surrounded them all. And word got back to the United States that there's one of their men who was all by themselves in the enemy's camp. And I tell you, it says that the, uh, the United States sends a, war, a, a team in there with helicopters and guns and they all land down in that one spot and they just jump off the, the helicopter and surround everything. They go in, get that one person and bring him out, the lone survivor, and bring him out. The United States is saying that one person, that one American in an enemy's camp is worth sending an army in after. That's exactly what Jesus did for every one of you. That he looked at each one of you and said, you are the lone survivor. If it's only you, I'm going to send my son Jesus to die on the cross. You matter more than you think you do. Somebody give God praise this morning. And the last one is I encourage you and I go to my seat. It's less about you than you think. Look at your neighbor. If you have glasses, pull it down. Say it's less about you than you think. I want, I, listen, 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 listen. I want everybody in the room to take a deep breath. <sighs> You're not responsible for everything. And everything is not your fault. I used to have this complex. That I thought everything was my fault. Ask my wife. It didn't, ma it didn't matter how well I knew you or how little I knew you. If you were angry, you had to be angry at me. Because everything was my fault. And I had to do everything I could 
to make things right for you. And after a heart attack and, and, and eight heart casts later, I realize if you want to be angry, that's on you. Even if it's me, it's on you. Because everything is not my fault. I can't own everything. I own what's mine, but I can't own yours. It's less about me than I thought it was. I can't be responsible for everybody. And everything isn't my fault. Now around the house, most things are still my fault. Not really. I'm right and she knows it. So, what, what was that? What, what? The other day we were in front of one of our granddaughters. And what was it? I, I said, I, I think, I can't remember if it was Sailor or Gwenny. And, and, and I said, Poppy's always right. And what was it you said back to him? Can't remember, but I remember. She said, <laughs> she said, yep, Poppy's always right about some things, and went on. She didn't, she didn't throw me under the bus, but she let the truth be known. Listen, we live with immense pressure on ourselves. I have to do it. I have to perform. No, you don't have to perform. You just be faithful. Sometimes God is working out a plan that you can't see. It's bigger than what you can see. One of the things that you must keep in mind, it's about the kingdom of God and not about us. Remember, Jesus said, go tell John what you've experienced. You've experienced the kingdom of God in operation. In other words, it's less about us than what we think it is. As long as the kingdom's in operation, we still got hope. Amen? Have you, have you ever, li, li, listen, I'll, I'll close with this, Joey. I'm done. You can go ahead and come up. Have you ever wondered about Adam and Eve? Have you ever wondered about why when they sinned, God didn't just wipe them out, start over? I mean, it was the beginning. Yeah, yeah, wipe them out. Psst. I'll tell you, you all wouldn't like it if I was God. Man, I'd be wiping. Psst. Psst. How about you? Well, pretend you wouldn't. Somebody cut you off at of Walmart. Psst. Right? <laughs> How many have ever been in line at uh, 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 some store? I'll wipe those suckers out. DMV. Huh? Just happened to think about it. DMV. You got an appointment? No. Take a number. E55. And you see E15. <laughs> but that's only if you were God. But look at your neighbor and say, but you aren't. No, for you. But think about it. Why didn't God just wipe them out and start over? Because God isn't into replacing damaged goods. He's about restoring damaged goods. If God would have Adam and Eve, he definitely would have you. God isn't about replacing damaged goods. He, he's about restoring damaged goods. He's about restoring you. He's about restoring your life. He's about restoring your marriage, your family, your finances. Stop thinking there's no hope. Because as long as you're breathing, there's hope for you. I don't know who I'm speaking to this morning, but I'm speaking to somebody 
I'm just here to encourage everybody who hears this message. This is the message that God gave me. God is, God, God is not trying to hold you under his thumb. and He's not just trying to find an excuse to wipe you out. He, he is trying to get you to understand, listen, I've got my hand on you because I have a future and a hope for you. And it doesn't matter how far you've fallen. It doesn't matter how dark your past has been. He just wants to bring you into his marvelous light and turn your entire life around. We're all there. We've all been there. The problem is, as many of us forgot what it was like to be there. And maybe just for a moment, you can think back to where God brought you from. Think back for a moment as to who you used to be and what you used to do. And you think about the truth of Jesus Christ when it penetrated your heart. And you made a decision to come to know and accept Him. He turned your entire life around. He took all that darkness, all that sin, all that C-R-A-P, and He threw it into the sea of forgetfulness. And in an instant, you felt the pressure go. You felt the weight go. In an instant, your darkness was gone, and now you are a king's son. God is not in to replacing damaged goods. He's into restoring damage. God's not going to replace you. He wants to restore you. Why? Because it bothers Him to see us living a life that He didn't create for us to live. Your Father takes great joy when He sees you overcoming and when He sees you moving forward. Pastor, lately it feels like I take a step forward, three steps back. Well, thank God you took a step forward. You know, I, I'm mo- most of you understand I, I, I'm a very simple individual. Um, I don't say that in, in, in a criticizing way because I just am who I am. I, 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 I'm... I'm uh, uh, by God's grace, I, I, I'm relatable. Uh, I love people. And my relationship with the Lord is very simplistic. I wouldn't want it any other way. I wouldn't want a c- complex relationship with God because I might not be able to understand it. But very early in, in, in my walk with the Lord, I come to understand that He holds the whole world in his hand. I think they even sang a song about that in, in Bible school back. Remember, remember, how many of you went to Bible school uh, when you were a kid in the summer? Was it Bible school? Is that what it's called? BBF. Yeah, B, yeah, B. And remember, I, I remember going into an old Baptist church. At the time, it had two pot belly stoves, one on each side, to tell you how old it was. To tell you how old the church was, not how old I am, but it was. It had two pot belly stoves on each side, and that's how they had warmed the church. But in the summertime, you didn't have to worry about that. And we get in there, and and uh, do you know that he's got the whole world in his hand? Uh, can can you uh, b- begin to play that, and 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 then maybe at some point you can begin to sing it because they don't want me singing. Can can you play that? He's got the whole. Are you playing it now? Oh, yeah, there it is. There it is. And I, I remember they'd get up there and they'd peck out on that piano. They'd peck that song out on that piano. And, 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 and little Betty Bowyer, Betty Bowyer, she was, she was uh, kind of like the, the vacation Bible school uh, 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 guru. She kind of planned all of it. And, and, and she was our cook in elementary school. And she, I was one of her favorites. She always gave me extra mashed potatoes and extra anything else I wanted uh, just because she was so sweet. And, and, and she'd get up there and, and she would peck that out on that piano and she'd begin to sing. He's got the whole yeah, you know, he, world in his hand. Come on. He's got the whole world. Think about it. In his hand. He's got it He's all. Got the whole that load you're carrying, it's not hand. yours. And God's just He's trying to get you to understand it isn't yours, Trevor. It's his. his. You don't have to carry it. Keep going, Joey. He's got He's the got itty bitty baby. Baby. 
He's got it all. Right there. Come on, keep singing. He's got you and me, brother. He's got you and me, brother. See, but come on. Some of you need to shake that stuff off you're carrying. You just got to shake it off. Can we all stand for a moment? And some of you just look like a doll. You shake it off. He's got your problems. You and me, sister. You want the problem? No, I want He's got your problems. Yours and my problems. There you go. In his I'm hands, going to row. He's got yours and my problems. He's got it all. In his hands, he's got the whole world in me. Now let hands. me ask you one question. Are you in his hands? Place yourself in his hand. In this moment, in this world today, nothing else matters except have you made the decision to put yourself in his hands? You're doing better than you think you are because you've got an opportunity before matter more than you think you do because Jesus Christ went to the cross so that you could have an opportunity to live for eternity. And it's less about you than you think because he never created you to carry it because he's your burden bearer. So this morning, whatever it is that you feel pressure in in life, I want you to bring it to him right now. I want you to leave your seat. I want you to bring it to him. Whether it's marriage, finances, life, Family, come on, I know there's more than six people who's feeling pressure this morning. You bring it to him. This morning, if you don't know him as your Savior, or your walk with him isn't what it used to be, you want that relationship back, you come around this altar and just pray. Ask him for it back. If you don't know him as your Savior, the only thing you've got to do is come and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today I want to accept you as my Savior. Whatever it is, whatever the pressure is, you've got big decisions coming up. Come and pray about it this morning. Is there anybody here this morning that has a surgery coming up this week and you want prayer for it? Anybody? Is there anybody? Come up here and get around this altar. Hey, hey, somebody bring somebody bring me in. Hey, give me that chair. Come on up here, brother. Come on up here. Give me that chair. Come on. Sandy, bring him up here. Yeah, bring him up here. Come up here and sit down here. Put that chair right here. Well, I like that chair. That's a nice one. How you doing, brother? How you doing? What's your name? Chris? I'm going to have somebody come pray with you. Is that okay, Chris? I need a Holy Ghost-filled man to come and pray with Chris. Who is it? Kenny? Tommy? Yep, go ahead. I need some people to come and pray over Dennis this morning. You're having surgery tomorrow? Come right here beside Dennis and Ann. I need some men and women to come and pray over Dennis and Nan right now that will have surgeries this week. Come on. He holds it all, but you've got to put yourself there. So whatever it is, you come now. And I'm going to release this church to come and pray over the people in, 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 that's around this altar. You don't necessarily have to lay your hands on them. You can just get behind them and pray over them. You come now. Come on, church. Let's come and pray for our own this morning. King, come here. 
Chris, yeah, go ahead. You're good. You're good. Christ alone. Josh, hey, Hurst, come here. Would you come pray, pray with Trevor? Tasha, come here. Hey, Davina, come up here a minute. Right here, begin to pray. Pray over Nan. Yep, Nan. Don't leave the same way you came. You've got a struggle or a battle. Bring it to the Lord. This is a great opportunity for all of us to come. In Christ alone, I place my trust. Everybody just stay right where you are this morning. Around the altar, just stay there for a moment. Never has and he never will. He's 
That's why I trust him. That's why I trust him. I want um, one last thing I'm going to ask everybody to do this morning. Some of you, this is it's going to bother you. But sometimes you just have to speak something over yourself. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what other people have said. Doesn't matter how other people's encouraged you. Sometimes you just got to be David, and you got to encourage yourself and others. Sometimes you'll look around, and there will not be anyone else around you, and you'll feel like everyone's against you. That's all right. You just encourage yourself in the Lord. So I want everyone. To repeat after me, okay? You're doing better than you think you are. Let's change that. I'm doing better than I think I am. I matter more. I matter more than I think I do. And it's less about me than I think. I'm here to tell you, you are doing better than you think you are. You matter more than you think you do. And take a deep breath because it's less about you than you think. And you remember those three things and you live by them. When you have a battle come up in front of you, just remember it's God's battle, not yours remember those three things. Hey, I'm doing better than I think I am. I matter more than I think I do. You know, I, I look around and I see people who's lost loved ones this year and I see the stress and the strain on them and, and I can see that God is working something in the future. I can see that God's working it out for their good and I wish that I could get them to see that but that's not my job. My job is just to do my best to get us ready to meet Jesus. But what you need to understand is that God's already gone before you. He's making a way. There, there's some of you praying that God will bring you a spouse. If, if you just realize it's less about you than you think and stop working and trying to make things happen, He's already got somebody waiting for you. He's just trying to get you past yourself so He can bring them in. I guess what I'm trying to say is stop seeking after counterfeit avenues when God's trying to bring you the genuine article himself. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you touch each of us where we are. Lord, only you know, only you know the husband and wife that so desperately wants a child. And, Lord, I pray that they would stop trying to make it happen and just allow you to bring it to pass. Lord, do it for the, the man, the woman who's trying to make something happen for a spouse and realize that you already have the one waiting. Just bring him in. Lord, release those finances to clear up the situation. Touch the physical body, Lord. May the kingdom be in operation this week, and may those operations go smoothly without hindrance, complication, or issue. And Lord, may a good report come forth. Lord, 
Lord, touch every heart under the sound of my voice right now, whether they're watching by internet in Mount Olive or St. Mary's or here in this sanctuary. And Father, may we just seek you and understand that you are the majority. And as long as you're in it, success is inevitable. I thank you for it. And I ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. God bless you all. You are dismissed. We'll see you Wednesday night.